Now, before we start the book, let's discuss a little bit about the book. Okay? Do you know about the name of the book? Sahih Bukhari, what's the name? What is it called? Sahih al-Bukhari? Okay. What is Bukhari? It's the name of the book? Yes. It's the name of the person who collected the book. I don't want to say he wrote the book. I mean, in a way he did because he wrote the narrations. All right, But the text is from who? The Sahaba or the Prophet ﷺ. So anyway, he's the Imam Bukhari. Right? He's the author of this book, the compiler of this book. And this is the reason why the book is called Sahih of Bukhari. Sahih al-Bukhari meaning Sahih of who? Imam Bukhari. Now, Imam Bukhari, Bukhari was not actually his name. Alright? Inshallah, we'll talk about that at another time. My goal is that in every class, inshallah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Imam Bukhari. Alright? Or the teachers of Imam Bukhari. Or about hadith authenticity. Alright? Different things throughout the course. So you may have a lot of questions right now. Well, what is narration? Right? Or what is sahih? What does that mean? Right? Narrators of hadith. Who are these people? How does this work? Think of it as a jigsaw puzzle. Okay? I'm going to give you pieces slowly and gradually. Because we're only able to have this class once a week, right? So I can't give you the entire science of hadith in one day. Okay? I can't do that. So inshallah, I'm going to give you pieces over time so that you can, by the end, have a complete picture. Inshallah. Alright? Now, the name of this book is actually Al-Jamir. Make note of this. Okay? Write down the name of the book. The actual complete name of the book is Al-Jamir Al-Musnad Al-Sahih Al-Mukhtasar Min Umuri Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wa Sunanihi Wa Ayyamihi Long name. I'll give you time to write it down. Okay. Al Jamir Al Musnad Al Sahih Al Muhtasar Min Umuri Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Wa Sunanihi Wa Ayyamihi. This name is more like a foreword. Alright? Or an introduction. You know when you open up a book? You read the foreword or the introduction to the book, right? Which tells you what the book is about. Well, the title of the book tells us exactly what this book is about. Okay? Now, I'll tell you what these words mean. Would you like to know? Yeah? Okay. Have you heard any of these words before? Like Al-Jamir or Al-Musnad, Al-Sahih. Alright? Some of these words. Okay. Al-Jamir. This book, this collection of Imam Bukhari, he called it Al-Jamir. What does Jamir mean? Jamr, to collect, right? So Al-Jamir meaning a comprehensive collection. A comprehensive collection of hadith pertaining to various topics. Okay? Now, remember that before Imam Bukhari, there were many people who compiled books of hadith. This was not the first time that somebody compiled a book of hadith. All right? There were many scholars before him who had compiled books of hadith. Basically, there were two types of hadith books up until the time of Imam Bukhari. One type of hadith book was like hadith and fiqh. Okay? So for example, Imam Malik, he compiled his Muwatta. This is one of the, one of the first books of hadith. Alright? And basically in that, Imam Malik, he proved different things related to fiqh. What is fiqh? Do you know what fiqh is? What does fiqh literally mean? Understanding. So understanding of the knowledge, meaning how to implement it. So for example, how do you do wudu? How do you pray? How do you give zakat? How do you fast? What are all the rulings related to fasting? What are the rulings related to hajj? Alright? What are the rulings related to marriage and divorce and eating halal and the haram food? You understand? All the rulings related to these topics. Alright? 
So the hadith books were like that. They were basically hadith and fiqh. Okay? Or other authors, what they had done was they just compiled all the hadith they knew. All right? Without any order or without any particular goal. Imam Bukhari, what he did is that he divided his book into many chapters. All right? And those chapters were not just related to prayer and fasting and wudu and hajj. No. He also dedicated a chapter on tafsir. He dedicated a chapter to ilm, knowledge. He dedicated a chapter to the major events in the life of the Prophet ﷺ. He dedicated a chapter to the merits of the companions. He dedicated a chapter to Bad'ul Khalq, the beginning of the creation. He dedicated a chapter to Iman, a faith-related matters. So it is called Al-Jamir because you're not just going to learn in this book, oh, the Prophet ﷺ said this and this and this and this and this. And this. You're going to learn in this book fiqh. So for example, the chapter that we're going to start with is going to be about sajda of tilawa. You know there are verses in the Qur'an which when you recite you're supposed to prostrate. Right? So we're going to learn a hadith related to that. Alright? And then inshallah, later on, we're also going to learn a hadith about janaiz, funerals. Alright? There's also chapters about business dealings. Okay? So this is why this hadith book is called Al-Jamir. Because it's a comprehensive collection of hadith pertaining to which topics? One or two? Many. Various. And there are at least eight different categories of these topics. Alright? Now, secondly, it is called Al-Musnad. Musnad. What does Musnad mean? Musnad is from the word Sanad. Alright? And Sanad means a chain. A chain. Chain of narration. Okay? Now, when we talk about hadith, we generally say, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ Alright? And we commit a great injustice over there. And that injustice is that we ignore the people who were a means of conveying those words of the Prophet ﷺ to us. Who was the companion? Now many times we'll mention the name of the companion. Abu Huraira reported. Right? Or Umar radiallahu anhu reported. Or Ibn Abbas reported. Ibn Umar reported. You know, we've heard many names of the companions. Their names are mentioned, and then the hadith is mentioned. Right? But there was somebody who learned that hadith from that companion. Right? And then that somebody, they taught this hadith onto someone else. And they taught that hadith to someone else, their student. Right? And the people who collected the knowledge of hadith, they didn't do things like, oh yeah, you know, I was walking one day and I heard somebody saying a hadith, so yeah, that's a hadith. No. It didn't work like that. You know what people would have to do? I mentioned to you this morning about how a man traveled from Medina to Damascus to learn how many hadiths? One book? One hadith. Inshallah, I will tell you about how much Imam Bukhari traveled. He had at least 1,000 teachers. At least 1,000 teachers. And by teacher, I don't mean somebody randomly there from whom he heard hadith. No, somebody in whose gathering he sat. You understand? He sat in that gathering. We learn about Imam Malik. He was also a great scholar of hadith. His student, he came from so far away. And one day, when Imam Malik was teaching, what happened? This is in Medina. Alright, what happened? There was a noise. Oh, there's elephants, there's elephants. Now, that was a big deal. 
because there were no elephants in Arabia. All right? If elephants came into Medina, it means they came from from far away, from Africa. All right? And so, you know, when people heard these people are sitting listening to hadith and they hear there's elephants, so what happened? One by one, everybody left to go see the elephants. Right? But there was one student that was still sitting over there. And Imam Malik said, aren't you going to go? He said, I didn't come all the way over here to watch elephants. I came all the way over here to learn hadith from you. And he spent years in the company of Imam Malik. When people wanted to learn hadith, they didn't just go attend a lecture here and a lecture there. They would travel and they would stay for days and months, years in the company of their teachers. You know, we, we learn about scholars, they spent 10 years in Medina. They spent 10 years in Mecca. You think that's a big deal? Mashallah, it is a big deal. Definitely. But the people of Hadith, this is their tradition. They traveled for years and years. So anyway, a Musnad is a book of Hadith in which the Sanad is mentioned with the Hadith. Meaning the chain of narrators is mentioned with the Hadith. Alright? So for example, today, when we will learn the Hadith, so for example, we see a long chain. حدثنا محمد بن بشار قال حدثنا غندر قال حدثنا شعبة عن أبي إسحاق قال سمعت الأسود عن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال So you see the first line and a half is basically what? What is it? It's the chain of narration. Now remember I said there is a great injustice we commit over here? You see even in the translation, the chain is not translated. Right? And when the chain of narration is mentioned, it seems like a burden. Well, who are these people and what's going on? Why don't you go straight to what the Prophet ﷺ said or did? Well, because we couldn't have had it if these people didn't narrate it. They did a huge favor on us. Who was Muhammad ibn Bashar? Who was Ghundar? Who was Shu'bah? Who was Abu Ishaq? Who was Aswad? Who are these people? They were people who learned hadith and transmitted it. Right? So a musnad is a book in which the sanad, the chain of narration, is mentioned with the hadith, with the exact text. Alright? This only shows us the authenticity of the hadith narrations. Alright? Now inshallah we will have a discussion on how do we know this chain of narration is authentic. Alright? How do we know that? Inshallah we will discuss that also. Thirdly, after al-musnad, it is called al-sahih. What does the word sahih mean? Sah, right. Sahih, right as in authentic. Okay? Have you heard things like, well, this is a sahih hadith, an authentic hadith. This is a hasan hadith. There is a weak hadith. Such and such narration is fabricated. Have you heard these words? Yeah? When it comes to the statements of the Prophet ﷺ, remember the hadith was narrated, right? The chain of narration. Now the chain of narration, the people who transmitted the hadith, right? There are some narrations which are graded as sahih. Alright? Give it like an A star. Okay? An A star or an A. Grade A. Okay? Sahih hadith. Meaning, this chain of narration, these people, this teacher and this student and then this student of theirs and that student, oh, perfect. You don't, it's authentic. Grade A. Alright? Imam Bukhari has collected in this book a hadith of which grade? Grade A. This is why it's called Sahih. Remember that there are five grades. Okay, for those of you who are interested, if you think it's a little too much, don't worry about it. You'll get used to it, inshallah. Okay? But you can note this down for your own understanding. So there's five grades. The first is sahih. Sahih, grade A. Okay? Authentic. The second is hasan. Hasan means good, so B plus. Alright? Then there is da'if. Da'if. Da'if means weak. 
Alright? And you could give it like D or C minus. Okay? Then there is ضعيف جدا. Very weak. What's lower than D? Then there is mawdur. Fabricated. And that's like totally F. Like completely. Okay? And remember that for each of these categories or grades, there are subcategories also. Okay? Inshallah, with time, if you're interested in learning about those categories, we can go over them. Inshallah. Now, Imam Bukhari collected in this book only Sahih. Grade A. You understand? So what does this mean? This means that when you look at any hadith in Bukhari, do you have to worry about authenticity? No. You don't have to worry about it. Which is why many times when you read a hadith and at the end it says Bukhari, what do you do? Oh. Isn't it? So, again this was unique because no one before him had ever collected a sahih. There were many hadith collections before Imam Bukhari. But none of them were a sahih. Okay? Now, the next is al-mukhtasar. What does mukhtasar mean? Hmm? Brief, short, abridged. Does anyone have the complete set of Bukhari? Sahih Bukhari? You do? How many volumes is it? How many? Eight or nine? Nine. This is mukhtasar. Okay? This is mukhtasar. Abridged. What this means is that Imam Bukhari collected authentic ahadith on various topics, but he did not collect all the authentic hadith on those topics. Some people think that authentic ahadith are only in Bukhari. So if it's not in Bukhari, don't tell me. This is wrong. Because in the Sahih of Imam Bukhari, there are all authentic ahadith. Right? All the ahadith are authentic, but not all authentic ahadith out there are in Bukhari. You understand? So this is how it is al-mukhtasar, it is abridged, it is summarized. Okay? So this book is jamir in its scope, meaning in the topics and the themes that it covers. But it is mukhtasar in its content. You understand? And this is the beauty of it. You'll find authentic hadith on various topics, but you won't find all of the hadith to make it very long and difficult to study. Okay? Then it says, Al-Jami' al-Musnad al-Sahih al-Mukhtasar min umuri Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. From the affairs of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Meaning, he's collected all the matters related to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Which means that in this book you will find the statements, actions, approvals. Alright? Wasunanihi and his sunan. Who's sunan? The sunan of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Sunan is a plural of sunnah. Alright? What does sunnah mean? Way. Okay? So, we won't just find statements, actions, approvals. We will also find the sunnahs of the Prophet ﷺ in this book. And then after that, وَأَيَّامِهِ And also his ayyam. What does ayyam mean? Hmm? Days. Days of the Messenger ﷺ. Yes. What that means is his biography. All right? And the different incidents in his life, the important events in his life, also we learn in Bukhari. So in a way, it's also a seerah book. You understand? You could be learning aqidah. You know what aqidah is? Belief. Right? You could learn fiqh. Right? You could learn history. You could learn seerah. You will even learn tafsir from Sahih Bukhari. This is how comprehensive this book is. Remember I told you at the beginning that the name of the book itself is a is a an introduction to the book. Right? So the title, does it tell you about what the book is about, what it contains? Yeah? So 
From the name, what do you understand? What are you going to learn in this book? From Jamir. What does Jamir mean? Let me quiz you. Raise your hand. What does Jamir mean? Yes? Yes. Don't forget that, okay? Jamir doesn't just mean collection. It means collection of various topics. Very good. Secondly, Musnad. What does Musnad mean? Raise your hand and explain a Musnad to me. I want you to be able to understand these terms. Okay? Raise your hand. What is a Musnad? Okay, so the chain of the narrators are also found in this book, corresponding to the hadith that they narrated. Okay, al-sahih, what does that mean? Authentic, so what does it mean? What does the sahih, the term sahih, what does that tell us about Sahih Bukhari? Let her answer. Excellent. That all of the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, they are sahih, they are grade A. Okay? All authentic. The next is Al-Mukhtasar. What does that mean? Yes. Sharp, abridged. abridged. So what does that mean? Anything else? About Al-Mukhtasar? Okay. It's Mukhtasar in its content. So every hadith on every topic and every hadith that is authentic will not be found in this book. Alright? What you will find is authentic ahadith on various topics, but not all of the authentic ahadith out there. Right? The next is, مِنْ أُمُورِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وسلم. What does that tell us about the book? Yes? The ways, the matters of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Very good. وَسُنَنِهِ وَأَيَّامِهِ What does that mean? سُنَنِهِ وَأَيَّامِهِ Very good. So the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And secondly, ayamihi, his days meaning the important events. Alhamdulillah. Any question? Yes. Well, it depends. You can say hadith and a hadith depending on what you're saying. But don't say hadiths. Please. Okay? Don't say hadiths. Don't. If you're talking about one hadith, say hadith. Alright? And if you're talking about many hadith, say a hadith. Likewise, don't say sahabas. Please. Sahaba itself is plural. It's the plural of sahabi. Okay? Sahabi, one companion. Sahaba, companions. So don't say companions. Okay? Somebody had a question here? Yes. Okay. Mukhtasar means abridged, short. So for example, when it comes to sujood al-Qur'an, the matter of prostrating when reciting certain verses of the Qur'an, okay? There are many authentic ahadith out there. Many. But Imam Bukhari has not recorded all of them here. Okay? He has recorded only a few. You understand? So for example, if there were 50 authentic grade A ahadith related to the topic of prostrating at the recitation of the Qur'an. Imam Bukhari did not record all 50. What did he do? He just selected a few. And he put those. And this comes with wisdom. Right? That you know what to choose. Alright? What will suffice? What will be enough? What is... Insha'Allah, sufficient to understand a particular topic. Alright? Any other question? Can you sometimes you give the reference of Tirmidhi also, right? Okay. So what are the uh, authentic uh, Okay, good question. Earlier I mentioned a hadith and I mentioned the reference as a Tirmidhi. Alright? So which means that all a hadith are not in Bukhari. There's many other hadith collections out there. Right? Now, there are many different ones, but there are six books of hadith which are known as Sihah Sitta. The six Sihah. Sihah, it's the plural of Sahih. Now, this doesn't mean that every single hadith in all of these books are grade A. Okay? What it means is, of course, when it comes to Bukhari, all authentic, all grade A. 
All right? But when it comes to a tirmidhi or when it comes to Ibn Majah, right? There are some ahadith that are of a lesser grade, but alhamdulillah, they have been pointed out. All right? Inshallah, we will talk about the different books of hadith later if the opportunity comes up. For now, let's look at Sahih Bukhari. Why have we selected this book and why is this book so important? Why have we selected Sahih Bukhari? The reason is that Sahih Bukhari is considered as the most authentic book after the Qur'an. Let that sink in. It is the most authentic book after the Qur'an. You see, any book that you read, even your textbook at school, that has been written by like four or five uh, professors, could there be mistakes? Many. Do you find them? You do. Are there things which you read and you're like, is this really, really somebody wrote this? What were they thinking? Right? Are there errors? Yes. And if there's a book that's like from 20 or 30 years ago, then what? Research has proven that now this is not correct anymore. Which is why every year or so, what is it that they do? New version, new version. So you can't take the book that your brother studied five years ago. You have to get the eighth edition and only the eighth edition. Isn't it? Because even though experts wrote the book, there are errors in it. So when you will study any book, you do so knowing that there could be problems here. So I have to be on guard. When it comes to the Qur'an, what do we learn in Surah Al-Baqarah? The first thing we learn, ذَلِكَ kitab لَا رَيْبَ فِي There is no doubt in it. When it comes to Sahih Bukhari also, every hadith is authentic. You know what that means? If it's written in Bukhari, it means it actually happened. The Prophet ﷺ actually said that. That incident actually happened. It is the most authentic book after the Qur'an. We learn Imam al-Nawawi said that all the scholars have unanimously agreed that the most authentic book after the Qur'an is which one? Bukhari. Imam Bukhari, why did he compile this book? As I mentioned to you, no one before him had compiled a book of this nature. Isn't it? How did he get that idea or why did he do it? I will tell you, inshallah, about Imam Bukhari's knowledge, how much he learned, how much he traveled, where he learned from. Inshallah, we will do that. Imam Bukhari was a very knowledgeable man. He was also a very honest man, a man of character. So much so that we learn about him that once he was traveling, he was going on a ship, and he you know, met somebody who was also on the ship. And you know, you get to know people and you talk to them and you become more friendly with them and then you share some of your personal things with them. So Imam Bukhari mentioned to that man that he had a thousand dinar with him. Imam Bukhari told him, that, yeah, I've got one thousand dinar with me. I'm sure he wasn't showing off. For whatever reason, he let that man know. Now that man, he's like, one thousand dinar, that's a whole lot of money. There's somehow, you know, I could just get that money somehow. So what he did, one morning, he started making noise. Somebody stole my money. Somebody stole, stole my money. I can't find it. And everybody's like, how much money? What did it look like? Where was it? And he said, it was a thousand dinar in a pouch that was like this. And it was the exact description of Imam Bukhari's money. So basically this man's idea was that people are going to search for it and they're going to find it. Imam Bukhari's thousand dinar and they're going to say it's mine and they're going to give it to me. So Imam Bukhari, he's going to be perceived as a thief. He didn't care about Imam Bukhari's image. He just wanted the money. You know what happened? People searched and searched and they didn't find any thousand dinar. They didn't find it. And they said, you're just making noise, man. Go to sleep. Anyway, that man, he was amazed. He's like, where did that money go? So he asked Imam Bukhari later, where did you hide it? Nobody could find it. Where did you put it? And Imam Bukhari said, I threw it in the water. I got rid of it. He's like, what? Why did you get rid of it? He's like, I don't care about the money. If people accuse me of committing theft when I have not committed theft, 
will they trust me with regards to the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ? They'll never do that. Imam Bukhari got rid of a thousand dinar just to protect his image. And that also not for himself. For what? For the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. Are we willing to spend even a thousand dollars? Dinar, by the way, is not dollars. It's much more. Are we willing to spend even a thousand dollars in order to learn this knowledge? Anyway, he was a man of character. All right. Now, Imam Bukhari, he had a dream once. And he had a dream that he was in front of the Prophet ﷺ. And he was chasing away flies from the Prophet ﷺ with a fan. Have you seen those hand fans? Right? He said he was using that in order to chase away flies from the Prophet ﷺ. So he asked many people about the interpretation of that dream. And they said that you will remove lies from the Prophet ﷺ. The lies that are attributed to him, the lies that people say, that, oh, he said this, whereas he never actually said that. So you will remove those from him. Imam Bukhari said that once we were with Ishaq ibn Rahwe, who was one of his teachers. So he said we were with him when he said, if only you all would compile a book that has only the authentic hadith of the Prophet wasallam. If only somebody would do that. So the teacher expressed his wish. I wish there was a book a brief book, a muhtasar book, that had in it only the authentic ahadith. So Imam Bukhari said, when I heard that, that encouraged me. You know, that just, that settled in my heart, and I just had to do this. This is the reason why he compiled this book. And he said that it took me 16 years to compile Al-Jamir Al-Sahih. 16 years. Inshallah, we'll be spending one year, all right? Studying part of this book, not all. But Imam Bukhari spent 16 years just to compile it. Now how did he compile this book? What was the manner? What was the way in which he compiled this book? We learned that firstly, he compiled only the authentic narrations. Hmm? Then we learned that Imam Bukhari, he said, I wrote this book in Baytullah. What is that? Kaaba. Masjid al-Haram. He said, I wrote it over there. And I performed two raka'ah istikhara for every hadith. So every hadith that he recorded in the book, before recording it, what did he do? He performed two raka'ah istikhara. We cannot even pray istikhara if we have to make some big decision. We're like, oh, can you do istikhara for me? Well, do it yourself, right? He said he did istikhara for every single hadith that he wrote in this book. And by the way, there's over 7,000 hadith in this book. So he prayed two rakar istikhara for every single one of them. And he said, when I would be certain about its authenticity in every way, then I would record it. So he didn't just record it saying that, oh, I think it's authentic. And you know what? I prayed, so it's okay. No, he prayed and he worked hard. And he said, I performed ghusl and two rak'ah salah before recording every hadith. So he didn't just perform two rak'ah, he also performed ghusl. Can I request you that every time we come to study hadith, let us also pray two rak'ah? before we begin the class, especially because we're coming in a masjid. And what does a masjid deserve? What does it deserve? That we pray to rak'ah when we enter the masjid. Right? So when we come in, inshallah, let us also begin our day with two rak'ah. Right? And let us carry this tradition of Imam Bukhari. So he selected only the authentic ones, and he performed istikhara, did ghusl, and he chose the best place. And then later, he added the chapter headings. Okay? 
you will see that the ahadith are not just recorded as 7,000 in a row. No. It is divided. The whole content is divided with chapter headings. And he entered those chapter headings in Masjid al-Nabawi. So he started this work where? In Masjid al-Haram. And he completed it where? Masjid al-Nabawi. Over a period of 16 years. This is how he compiled this book. And this is the reason why the status of this book is like no other. It is the most authentic book. And the scholars have highly praised this book. And some of the scholars said that it is a debt upon the ummah to even explain this book. Imam Bukhari deserves this from us, that we study this book. Now, inshallah, we will quickly, as I mentioned, we will read at least one hadith. So before I end the class, I want to, inshallah, just read the hadith so that we get the barakah, inshallah. The name of the book that we will be studying is Kitab Sujood al-Qur'an. The book of prostration during recitation of the Qur'an. And the first chapter heading is Bab ma jaa fi sujood al-Qur'ani wa sunnatiha. What has come, meaning what has been narrated about the sajda of the Qur'an and the sunan related to them. What is it that has been reported concerning prostrating at the recitation of certain verses. And what is the sunnah of it? Imam Bukhari brings the first hadith. حدثنا محمد بن بشار قال حدثنا غندر قال حدثنا شعبة عن أبي إسحاق قال سمعت الأسود عن عبد الله رضي الله عنه قال قرأ النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم النجم بمكة فسجد فيها وسجد من معه غير شيخ أخذ كفا من حصا أو تراب فرفعه إلى جبهته وقال يكفيني هذا فرأيته بعد ذلك قتل كافرا. It is related that Abdullah رضي الله عنه he reported that the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم recited سورة النجم at مكة and he did sajda in it and those with him also did sajda except for an old man who took a handful of pebbles and brought them up to his forehead and said this is enough for me Abdullah said I later saw that man killed as an unbeliever inshallah we will study the detail of this hadith when you actually have the book can I give you some homework? yeah? mashallah very good so your homework is to practice reading Actually, two things. Firstly, I want you to go to the website sunnah.com. S-U-N-N-A-H dot com. Okay? And over there, you will find different books of hadith. Bukhari, Muslim, Abu Dawood, different books. Okay? The first one is Bukhari. Okay? And I want you to click on Bukhari. And then look at all the different chapters. Okay? And find out how many chapters there are. Okay? And then I want you to find this chapter, which is Kitab Sujood al Quran. I'll let you know it's number 17. Okay? I want you to click on that. And then the second homework is I want you to practice reading the first hadith. I want you to read it in Arabic. Can you do that? Can you read it in Arabic? Even if it takes you 10 minutes, doesn't matter. Okay? But I want you to do this. What are the two things you have to do? What are the two things? Explore Sahih Bukhari. Okay? On sunnah.com. Not a book. I want you to use this website. Okay? And secondly, I want you to read this hadith in Arabic. Inshallah. Next class, inshallah. Don't forget to pray to Nafal when you come. Make sure you are in a state of wudu. And inshallah we will study the detail of the hadith. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.